All right, John, we're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the American Geographical Society Council, our members, and the staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this special leadership spotlight focused on technology and LGBT plus communities location privacy during COVID-19 with Victor Mar Madrigal Borlos, who is the United Nations Independent Expert on Protection Against Violence and Discrimination Based on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. To those of you participating in our conversation on WebEx and those that are watching our live stream on Facebook, it's great to have you joining us this afternoon. We are proud to partner our Ethical Geo Initiative with the Henry Luce Foundation to investigate the societal implications of geospatial technology and location tracking. Mobile location-based applications have become ubiquitous in our society. And as all of you know, they have changed the way we live our lives in a very short period of time. There are, however, problematic and unanticipated effects of using this technology. To better understand the ethical implications of its use, we have provided this platform to frame the discussion and to address these issues as they are already impacting our lives on a daily basis. COVID-19 has put a spotlight on the concept of using mobile tracing and surveillance to fight the pandemic. Around the world, the utilization of this technology to fight the coronavirus is being employed to various degrees and already governments and people worldwide are faced with the issue of compromised privacy and what that means as we go forward. Over the past several weeks, we have convened five blue ribbon panels and looked at the ethical implications of mobile location technology and the impact on vulnerable publics from an international perspective and from the unique American experience. In addition, we had a panel of national security leaders who focused on mobile tracing technology and its use in national security and the impact on democracy. This past week, we heard from state and local leaders who shared their invaluable experiences with us and from experts on the issue of data quality and building trust. In the case of all the panels, the discussions were eye-opening and extensive. We also had the opportunity to hear from Ambassador Samantha Power in a leadership spotlight session where she added the human rights aspects of the use of mobile technology. And most recently, we heard from the researchers at Harvard University who conducted the seminal study on the use of mobile location tracing in the United States. Today, we will be discussing how various location technologies used to fight COVID-19 may have negative consequences on LGBT plus human rights. This conversation will most certainly help serve as one of the sources of information and data that policymakers should use to help guide us into the future. Before we move on, I would like to explain to those of you on our WebEx platform the best way to get the most out of today's discussion. For those viewing on desktop computers or laptops, we recommend that you customize your viewing by hovering the mouse in the top right of your screen and selecting the icon in the middle. From the three options shown, please select Grid View for optimal viewing. During our Q&A session later, to ask a question, hover your mouse under the arrow and click on the question mark icon in the gray bar at the bottom of your screen. For those of you that are using a tablet or mobile device, select the icon with the three dots, which will then allow you to select the question mark icon to submit your questions to our panelists. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Marie Price, the president of AGS and our moderator for today's session. Welcome Marie and Victor. We're looking forward to your conversation. Thank you, John. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Since 2018, Victor Madrigal Borlos has served as the UN independent expert on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. His work assesses the implementation of international human rights law, raises awareness, engages in dialogue with all relevant stakeholders, and provides advisory services, technical assistance, capacity building to help address violence and discrimination against persons on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Dr. Madrigal Borlos, a Costa Rican jurist, is also a senior visiting researcher at Harvard Law School's Human Rights Program. Until June 2019, he served as the Secretary General of the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims, a global network of over 150 rehabilitation centers. He is the founding member of the Costa Rican Association of International Law, 
a founding board member of the International Justice Resource Center, and a founding board member of Synergia IDH. Victor, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you very much. So, Thank you very much for having me. Um, we have had uh, panels earlier in the year about uh, vulnerable publics and including LGBTQ community. I would really be helpful for our listeners if you could provide a brief overview of the work being done by the United Nations for the protection of the LGBT community and also how they've responded, particularly during the time of COVID. Thank you very much, Marie. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to be here and a great honor to be here. Uh, and thanks to the American Geographical Society, not only for inviting me, but most importantly for putting together this task force, which analyzes what I consider to be a fundamental aspect in data gathering and management. So thank you for that. And I look forward to continued work uh, together in relation to this issue. Now, of course, LGBT or otherwise uh, sexually uh, or gender diverse persons have existed all throughout history in every corner of the world. And therefore their lived realities have always been a part of the work, the human rights work that United Nations takes uh, forward. But in reality, it was never that visible. Uh, it was possibly uh, surrounded by the same conditions of opacity that LGBT lives uh, were surrounded of for a very long time. It is not all, it's only about some three decades ago that the work started in a, in, in a somewhat systematic way within the United Nations. Um, and really, um, we have to only go back to 2011 for the first time that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was requested to produce a report on the lived realities of LGBT persons and the violence and discrimination that they suffer around the world. Now, the outcome of this report was um, a, a harrowing perspective of violence and discrimination pervasive everywhere, and it produced the building blocks for a political uh, work creating uh, the mandate of the independent expert uh, that I have the honor uh, to actually um, occupy since January of 2018. The mandate of the independent expert was created in 2016, the first mandate holder being Professor Vitit Muntaporn of Thailand. I'm the second mandate holder. Now, since then, our work has been to provide visibility uh, to how violence and discrimination occurs uh, around the world in the everyday lived realities of persons and on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And secondly, on the basis of that knowledge, we have the mandate of providing advice to states uh, in relation to what measures can be put in place to ensure that violence and discrimination are addressed and, 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 and eventually eradicated. Now, in March of this year, when it became evident that COVID-19 was a, a, a phenomenon uh, of absolute unique nature, um, I was very aware that the mandate had no pandemic plan in place. And so very fast, I actually placed the mandate in a very active listening position. Um, I uh, sent a number of open letters to LGBT communities around the world. And beginning at the end of uh, March and ending towards the beginning of April, I held a series of town meetings and participated in dozens of gatherings to hear the problematic as lived by LGBT persons. Uh, and how they were interacting in their uh, experience with the pandemic and the conditions created by pandemic response, of course. All in all, in that process, uh, I, I have counted interactions with over a thousand individuals coming from over a hundred different countries that provided both anecdotal evidence and perspectives on the implications of the pandemic on LGBT persons. Now, the process continues with another couple of measures that I'll refer later, but I want to now mention to you what are the what are what is the basic finding that I have <clears throat> actually arrived to in relation to this. 
pandemic response becomes problematic for vulnerable and historically discriminated persons for many reasons. But in the particular case of LGBT persons, I've been able to create a systematization of three particular. The first one are actions in which it is the suspicion or evident that the state is using the pandemic to persecute LGBT persons and to pass either political measures or persecuting measures that otherwise would be unviable um, in any other context. So an abuse of the state of exception. Um, I, I'm on the public record, for example, uh, concerned about uh, a particular rape in an LGBT uh, shelter in Uganda, where the motive given was COVID-19 measures infringement, but in reality, very quickly one could see that the motive was that the local authorities uh, didn't want uh, um, a shelter catering for LGBT persons. I'm also on the record um, with, my, with enormous concern about the adoption by Hungary of certain measures regressing on the legal recognition of gender identity for trans persons in a context of pandemic where we know that legal recognition, legal recognition is essential to access certain help, uh, the Hungarian government has actually backtracked with a justification on the pandemic. So that's the first type of concern. The second is measures that, albeit without a discriminatory intent, end up having discriminatory impact because they are not designed either with good evidence or in consultation with the concerned communities. Let me give you an example. Certain Latin American countries designed and implemented gender-based quarantines in which on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, males would be able to go out, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, females would be able to go out. But these measures, which assumed that the world is divided neatly into male and female, did not take into account gender diverse persons, which were basically condemned to stay at home because on the day that their appearance was um, corresponding, their documents wasn't, and in the day their documents was corresponding, their appearance wasn't, their gender expression. So there you have an example of indirect impact, a measure not designed, but having an impact. And the third consequence of enormous concern is the fact that LGBT people do not arrive to this pandemic on a level ground. LGBT people across the board have lower outcomes when it comes to health. They are disproportionately represented in the ranks of the poor. 40% of homeless youth identifies as LGBT, which of course is uh, disproportionately representing LGBT persons in this population. It means that the pandemic will impact persons in a disproportionate way. And we will have the chance, Marie, to discuss about this, but the work of both my colleagues and special procedures, other special rapporteurs, and mine from that moment on has been to identify advice to states on how to address, prevent, and in the case necessary, uh, prosecute these instances of uh, abuse. Thank you for that summary. Obviously, you've been very busy, and I think we've all discovered it during this pandemic about even the uh, mandate to stay at home. If you are homeless, uh, you can't uh, comply, and uh, there have been some creative solutions, but obviously uh, real challenges. So the origin of this location tech task force is to look at the ethical implications of using mobile location technologies to track COVID-19. And most typically, these are through apps on uh, our cell phones or, or using Bluetooth connections. Um, and we're interested in how real-time location tech infrastructures could impact vulnerable communities, um, LGBT communities, immigrants, ethnic minorities. So from your perspective, what are the harms that you've identified, either unintended or intended, that um, LGBT 
people um, being tracked using these contact tracing tools um, have experienced or may experience. Thank you, Mary. And of course, this is a, a fantastically important point uh, nowadays. Now, interaction of LGBT communities with uh, apps is something that has a, a whole uh, history of its own because uh, in some contexts, um, apps uh, actually are the basis for individuals to be able to meet or to be able even to create communities. So there are some rather specific examples that I can give you about risks that even pre-time pre, uh, pre the, the pandemic. Um, for example, I've received a number of expressions of concern throughout the years of how hostile governments utilize dating apps by, by having their agents create fake profiles and then utilizing triangulation to entrap gay men who are actually seeking to contact other gay men. That is, for example, a very explicit example. That's a very a clear example of the way in which this technology can be used to actually uh, persecute persons. Now, I would say that the analysis of risk has a lot to do with the nuance of the context in which one is placed. As you may know, LGBT persons around the world live their lives in deeply contrasting realities. We have two, a staggering two billion people that nowadays live in contexts in which sexual orientation and or gender identity is criminalized. 69 countries in which that is the case. Well, now imagine in that situation what it means to ask persons to provide information about their sexual orientation and their gender identity. It is tantamount to self-incrimination. That is one aspect and one context in which one needs to reflect how can one understand the ethical implications of data gathering and management in a context in which the very identity that you're asking about is criminalized. And then you have other contexts in which decriminalization or criminalization never existed or decriminalization has been effectuated where deep stigma and discrimination still prevails. Um, I can give you a very specific example. There is a particular story that is um, important for the communities right now, happening from the lesson learned in South Korea, where tracing technology was not only being used, but the whereabouts of persons that actually had tested positive were being divulged. And in a way where it allowed the great public to access the information that a particular outbreak was coming from a traditionally LGBT quarter. And that information compounded itself with deep stigma and discrimination that has been cast over decades and sometimes centuries about the assumption that LGBT people may be promiscuous or are ill by their own nature or just do not follow social norms, that they're not good citizens. And this compounding, in my view, may not have had discriminatory intent but it clearly had a harmful impact on society. Uh, now imagine the reality in that example that I'm giving you. Persons who knew that this was the case started to then reportedly to use fake profiles and to give false information into the tracing applications, which means that the data will no longer have integrity. So not only you have created harm, but you have created distrust in the whole system which is of course a huge liability. And finally, even in contexts where acceptance is the rule, even in contexts where respect is the rule, you cannot rule out completely the possibility of political digression. There are many examples of contexts in which governments have requested their citizens to disclose information only to have a change of government make a very regressive government possess information on a particular 
uh, element of the identity of the persons. So all of these are the risks that are entailed in data gathering and management, which get exacerbated in the case of mobile um, data capturing and um, tracing. Why? Because as we all know, we put a lot more information unconsciously into our mobile devices that we even realize. The calculation right now is that it only takes um, a, a, a cycle of 21 days into your uh, imprint in uh, the digital data that is captured by your phone for experts to be able to figure out all of the elements of your life. And of course, that is very concerning when the appropriate uh, uh, framework is not in place. Mm -hmm. Those are really good points. Um, certainly, we have heard from uh, local governments who have tried contact tracing the importance of um, making the data accessible only to very few people and then cleaning the data, not keeping it um, after the tracing has happened. Um, so there are protocols that need to be in place to protect everybody, right? Because this is a lot of information. And the case you raised against South Korea has come up in um, other discussions as well. There are many uh, vulnerable populations have safe places that they gather. And this is very true in the LGBT community. And one of the real concerns is if this technology is not used well, these safe places may become exposed and, and no longer safe. Is this a concern that you share in thinking about uh, how uh, tracking technology moves forward under COVID? Absolutely. The relationship of LGBT persons with space and particularly with urban space is a constant that we cannot uh, ignore at all. It has to do with um, the creation of community. It has to do with the creation of notions of self and protection. In the case of trans persons, it basically is the difference between life and death. So all of those elements compounded with other statistically meaningful factors, for example, the fact that gay men and trans women are particularly represented statistically in persons living with HIV AIDS, will mean that they will typically be around centers of health that are designated for HIV AIDS treatment. Otherwise, in very many parts of the world, the work against HIV AIDS has allowed the work of support of LGBT communities. There's a number of social codes that are important in relation to this, and that so far have been managed by protocols of discretion, advertising by not putting signs on the street. Marie, I see this in every trip that I go. I'm often taken to clinics in which the work of counseling to LGBT persons and HIV um, uh, prevention is hand in hand, and they are usually in the outskirts, in non-specific places, because of concerns. Of course, that information has to do with very specific realities of safety and, and personal integrity. And, it concerns me enormously that uh, this information uh, might just be used in ways that are not uh, human rights compliant. You know, uh, I'm old enough that I remember when the um, AIDS uh, pandemic uh, came known to the world in the late 70s, early 80s. And um, I do remember that the concerns of stigma and privacy, and of course, we still live with HIV AIDS. There are uh, treatments, but it is around the world. And I wonder, has that experience helped to inform um, the concerns that the LGBT community faces with COVID? It has, uh, it has actually, in my uh, experience, um, created almost an organic relationship with the way pandemic response has been enacted within LGBT communities. On the one hand, you see this fantastically able, powerful movement that comes together because it has experience on how to deal 
with a pandemic that is, as you very rightfully say, strongly associated with stigma and discrimination and fear and exclusion and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and all over the world, um, my uh, observation has been of organizations that very fast were able to make the move to working on extremely basic issues. Um, so many of the persons in these communities don't have access to credit and don't have savings. Think of trans women that are disproportionately represented in the in the sex worker population, for example. Um, they are or rep extremely represented in the informal working settings. All of these people lost their livelihoods from one day to the next without bank accounts, without savings, without access to credit, in most cases because they don't have a recognized legal identity. They were basically facing the fact that in the following days, in the following hours, they didn't have what to eat. And the way that the community was put, put itself together, I believe built on experiences of resilience uh, of, of course, previous and the AIDS uh, pandemic being certainly the milestone um, example there. But it does, on the other hand, also um, ex uh, show to us how extreme vulnerabilities continue to exist out of stigma and discrimination. The number of religious and political leaders around the world, including in the United States, who have blamed on the existence of LGBT persons or sex marriage, for example, the existence of the pandemic itself, mm. is staggering. And as is staggering, in many cases, the lack of response of the highest political authorities condemning those expressions. And that has meant by association that there has been an increased level of violence against LGBT persons in a number of contexts, and also an extreme exacerbation of vulnerabilities expressed, for example, in terms of mental health that uh, that are faced by the community because fear is very real um anguish about the future is very real and if you, that you compound social rejection and compounded stigma it becomes uh, an extremely different difficult equation um i'd like to shift gears a little bit and and ask you a, a, a question regarding the united states um as you're well aware, uh, the Latinx and African American populations have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, do you see it relevant to address the intersectionality between these groups and the LGBT community in terms of particular vulnerabilities and improving our responses? I, I believe so. Um, my mandate, and all of my work is intersectional in nature. Very early on when I was doing my work, uh, a feminist activist from the Global South said to me, Victor, we embody many identities in one body. <laughs> we, we, we are not, our experiences of privilege or discrimination, which may vary in time and space, are the result of that multitude of identities that we embody in one particular case, so, so to speak. And that's a lesson that I have taken with me uh, all the time because it, it means that we cannot disregard that multiplicity of identities and the intersectionality. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge that one of the most powerful political decisions when it comes to, to data is what points do you recognize as valid and necessary points of data gathering and disaggregation, right? And so um, I believe that the data is screaming to us that there is disproportionate impact of poverty in black and Latino populations, as you said it very well. I can give you a number of examples taken out of my report on social inclusion. Trans women, for example, are six times more likely to be poor than their cis counterparts. But if you disaggregate and you actually see the population of black trans women, they are 36 times more likely to be poor mm. 
So mm -hmm. even there, you have a division that disaggregating the data by that population allows you a complete different understanding of how the evidence base works. Another example, this one coming from my work on COVID-19. It is a lot more common for Latino youth to uh, remain longer at home uh, and to have multi-generational family structures. It means, and, and of course within communities that are deeply, deeply uh, stigmatizing uh, sexual diversity and sexual orientation. A lot of these youth are now requested to stay at home, perhaps to share computer equipment in which they are probably reaching out, uh, conversations are being overheard, and we are finding out that the increased risk for depression, anxiety, substance use, and suicidality in uh, Latin youth, for example, is disproportionate in relation to others, because disproportionately they have decreasing positive social interactions, increasing negative so social interactions, economic strain, unemployment concerns, and increased housing stability. And we wouldn't be able to, to, to see that if that data wasn't crossed in uh, along those axes. Hmm. Um, but you mentioned Latin America. I mean, it is really the Americas that have some of the highest uh, infection rates. And um, um, I, th there are other places that are at least currently right high right now, the Middle East, uh, there's some areas of very high infection rates as well. Um, and you, you have to sort of look at what are the political contexts and uh, levels of trust that people have in their governments and authority and capacity, right? Um, and uh, I think so many states right now, again, in the Americas, the level of trust is not very high. And that has uh, real consequences in terms of developing policies that people feel like they should comply with or, or ignore. Um, so I wanted to uh, switch gears a little bit and um, you're a lawyer and um, and deal regularly with the international community. And do you have any examples of where um, contact tracing in the world ha is mandatory uh, as a way to fight COVID? Well, what we know now, as you know, of course, as you can imagine, this is a, a quickly moving target, right? We know. The last time that I saw a study in relation to this, more than 50 countries have implemented some sort of uh, contact tracing uh, applications. And, and these types range from completely voluntary to uh, decentralized, centralized, and then some in which is mandatory. Uh, my information is that we have uh, mandatory applications being used in China, in Bahrain, in India, in Indonesia. Um, and, 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 and in some cases, not established necessarily by law, but becoming de facto mandatory. For example, I have received a number of claims that in some cases, persons detained as a result of breaking quarantine or a curfew rules will not be released unless they download an application for example. Mm. So there you have uh, an example where it may be that it's not established as mandatory, but the circumstances in which it is actually enforced make it de facto mandatory. Um, and I'm, I'm actually receiving information, I would say constantly in relation to uh, situations uh, like that. And, and remember, we are also dealing in contexts where uh, because of the examples that I gave at the beginning, it is more likely to find yourself arrested because of breaking the quarantine if you are trans, because your conditions will compel you to be on the street exercising sex work, or if you're an LGBT shelter, because that is the shelter that will be targeted. So there you see how the cycle works, right? Then you will be the one kind of uh, downloading the application and so on and so forth. Now, Allow me to make a digression, but again, it's an example that predates the pandemic and from which we have learned so much. You know how the, the Chechnya so-called gay purge started? It started because there was a raid in which a telephone was seized 
and that telephone contained a series of informations of a person who was gay and had a network of gay persons, social network of gay persons around him. And the information mined from that phone gave rise to the persecution of a whole population in Chechnya. And when I, I'm on the record with two statements in relation to the concern that I, that I deployed in relation to this, that is a whole process of persecution that came from mining originally the information contained in one phone. Yeah. And that was not at the beginning the purpose. It was actually completely accidental the finding of that phone and the mining of information based on that. So there you have another example. Uh, I'm sorry to have digressed, uh, Mary, I just kind of made the connection, but, <laughs> but there you have a, a clear example where, um, where, where it works almost as mandatory. But by the way, um, just to complete that idea, the allegation in the Chechnya case is that people that were subsequently found through this, the mining of this information were subjected to either cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or torture to reveal their own networks. And that's how you can actually trace, of course. So the tracing can have a legitimate objective, but you can also trace with an illegitimate objective. The tracing in itself is, is, is just a method. Your purpose in relation to it is what needs to be legitimate. Otherwise, you may be in a situation of grave abuse. Mm. We definitely heard from people um, representing workers in the Gulf and how ma uh, apps are mandatory now. Everyone's supposed to have them on their phones. And um, they, I think people ob object less to contract tracing if it's voluntary, uh, but when it's mandatory or coercive, and the example you gave um, is, is deeply concerning. Um, Again, from a legal perspective, do you see um, movement where regulation for contract tracing is emerging in international law? And, and I say this because one of the end products of, of this um, set of panels is we're working with an organization in the UK on the Lotus Charter to try and come up with guidelines of the safe use of contact tracing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, now I'm going to be a bit humble, uh, Marie, uh, in relation to this. Um, this is a very, very highly specialized area with enormous technical components. But mm -hmm. the way that I understand this is that, of course, it's data, is information. And where I see international mm -hmm. law going is in maintaining itself at the level in which general principles can be identified that will be in a way, valid and applicable uh, everywhere. And then the construction of contextually appropriate uh, responses. And so for me, in my work on data, I make point of reference to two fundamental um, instruments, which is, on the one hand, the fundamental principles of official statistics, which are adopted by the Statistical Commission and endorsed by the General Assembly, of uh, the UN, which has a detailed set of implementation guidelines. And, and what they do in relation to that is to identify minimum legal frameworks to safeguard the human rights of individuals who provide data. And on the other hand, I had a source, the guidelines uh, on a human rights-based approach to data, which were issued by the Office of the High Commissioner um, for Human Rights which uh, are enormously useful because they include uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, force uh, uh, disaggregation, self-identification, transparency, and so on and so forth. On the basis of that work and many other sources, I issued a number of recommendations on what I consider to be best practices in relation to data in my report that I presented to the Human Rights Council a year and a half ago, my report on data, and which include do no harm, self-determination, privacy and confidentiality, lawful use, participation, transparency and accountability, and impartiality as seven basic principles to ensure that framework. And I think from the point of view of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, all of those are firmly grounded not only in international law, 
but also on the lived realities of LGBT people around the world. So if you were to ask me, I think that this is the ample framework where this exists. And now I go back to being uh, humble because I, I recognize that there may be specificities to contact tracing that are very connected to the way that this moves, you know, so fast as a as a mm -hmm. technological element that of course i i would leave more to the experts in this field mm. i think the um we have a panel um next week on uh convening uh, legal experts and i the the legal question of personal data i think is moved further along than the actual how is one's location um controlled in, in terms of these ideas of privacy. So that makes for a, a really interesting um, challenge. And we've the ability to track real time location is relatively new. And so this is yet one of these other new challenges that come along with technology. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in from listeners, but I wanted to um, turn a kind of more hopeful uh, direction and that um, obviously context matters. Some states uh, are, are much more um, accepting of the LGBT community and other states, as you mentioned, have um, you know, laws that are extremely exclusionary and prejudicial. Um, what do you see in terms of the idea of, of combating uh, COVID um, in a way that the LGBT community in uh, any country would be less vulnerable? What are the, the kinds of um, best practices that you could see putting into place? So um, as part of the process that I was describing that I undertook or and continue to undertake in relation to pandemic and pandemic response, very early on, I was able to issue um, a set of guidelines which um, I call the ASPIRE guidelines. And um, it's, a, it's a mnemonic device. I think that's the word in English. Um, that stands for acknowledging that LGBT persons are everywhere and that they are meaningful uh, parts of our communities. I think acknowledging is important because it lies at the base of uh, understanding that data needs to be gathered also in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity, but particularly because we live in a world where uh, a significant number of people still live under context in which the official discourse is that gay people do not exist in that territory. Mm. Mm. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, are uh, knowledgeable of such context, but some, even I was shocked at the beginning of my work to undertake official dialogue with uh, high level political officers that say these people don't exist in my country. So I think acknowledgement, uh, that's what the A is for. S is for supporting civil society that is led uh, and serving LGBT persons. Uh, I mentioned to you, Marie, to, in relation to one of your previous questions, the importance of these networks uh, that are also a huge asset for humanity in terms of pandemic response, but they need to be maintained strong if they are mm -hmm. to be that. And of course, I'm enormously worried about the frailty of some of these organizations when they are individually needing to face uh, the pandemic and the the, the the, the context created by the pandemic. P stands for protect. Uh, there needs to be a protection against persecution uh, of the types that I have uh, expressed, and that includes the maintenance, the, the continued access to an independent justice system that allows to mm -hmm. question decisions uh, that may be administrative and may be misguided. Um, I stands for indirect discrimination. It's a real risk, particularly when measures are not designed or implemented with active participation, which is the P mm -hmm. um, of um, 
of, uh, of participation of the communities. Um, it also is the case that we need representation of the communities in the groups that are working actively because expertise is uh, to be recognized as an asset in creation of pandemic response. And finally, an evidence-based approach that is necessary to ensure that public policy will be fundamented in evidence and in scientific thinking rather than in preconception and in stigma. Mm -hmm. um, so there you go, it's acknowledgement, support, protection, indirect discrimination, representation, and evidence, and that is ASPIRE. And those are the guidelines that I sent to all of the states in the international community um, at the end of May of this year, and which will be the basis of my dialogue with the international community, both in the presentation of my report to the General Assembly uh, and even going forward in relation to pandemic response. I think that there are a lot of lessons that we need to learn. Now, contact tracing and issues of such specialization, as you were mentioning, such as live location or um, will become part of that conversation. Because in my yeah. view, they must be subject to the same group of guarantees, um, which protect, of course, uh, the disclosure of any other type of information within their specificity. So to me, that's kind of the, the, the way to go. Um, mm -hmm. And ensuring, of course, that a human rights based approach, which includes uh, a clear support of the idea of non discrimination. So you might imagine we have a lot of questions. <laughs> People are uh, listening in and uh, enjoying the, the conversation. And one of the questions I think uh, you mentioned how apps have been very important for forming community for LGBT people. Can you think of any positive way that mobile contact tracing could specifically benefit LGBT community? Well, uh, let's imagine, I mean, one of the things that uh, the fundamental principles to which I was making reference recognizing recognizes is that data is always good if the, if the objective is legitimate. Mm -hmm. The more data you have, the more intelligence you have, the more you can actually take informed decisions about how reality looks. Uh, let's think about this, Marie. We could reproduce the world in our decision making process. If we could have a perfect reproduction of the world, decisions would be flawless because they would be informed mm -hmm. by the exact reproduction of reality, right? So if you could have mm -hmm. in front of you the globe with all of its complexity as a perfect, accurate representation. Well, I guess for many people, that would be the idea of God, right? It's, it's the <laughs> idea of perfect knowledge of reality. And so, of yeah. course, data is always good if the objective is good and data is always desirable. Let me give you an example where this, um, I, I come from long time association, as you said, from the world of torture. Uh, I happen to have had the honor of leading a number of task forces when it came to answering from hu human rights based responses in situations of conflict and of uh, coup d'etat, for example, a number of those. Real time information about where people were being taken, real time information about where people being, were being kept real-time information about how long they have been kept in that location, it was always fundamental to prevent torture because we all know that torture happens disproportionately in the first 24 hours of detention. The experience mm -hmm. of armed conflict and civil strife and repression in Latin America tells us that forceful disappearance happens inevitably within the first week where you're taking. So, of course, all of these elements would be enormously useful if you were to map and to understand, imagine, for example, secret detention centers. I mean, the applications would be absolutely, absolutely uh, endless. But of course, it all depends that you have the people receiving the intelligence for the appropriate purpose. And we go back to a question of political intent. Mm 
if the political intent is to persecute and to perpetuate stigma, then of course limitations are absolutely um, not only important, but uh, they become part of the reality in which people survive, providing false mm -hmm. information, ensuring decoys, this and that and so forth. This is why the idea of a strong legal framework of lawful use and the idea of transparency, the idea of informed consent, so many things become absolutely fundamental in relation to this framework. Another question from a viewer, um, basically saying, how can we be better allies to the LGBT community during COVID? In particular, are there resources or organizations you recommend uh, supporting, especially during this time? Um, well, the first one is, uh, I believe, uh, an acknowledgement. I'm going to use the A from my Aspire guidelines. I think that this pandemic created, during the beginning, I think now our understanding has become a lot more nuanced, created a drive for um, compartmentalization within different groups and communities. You know, we heard a lot about older persons. We heard a lot about persons living with disability. But in reality, nobody is just that, right? And so part, my work was very strongly aimed at ensuring that people would understand that when we are talking about LGBT people, there is an intersectionality that needs to, we need to understand that there are older LGBT people, that there are young that are staying at home, older that are facing their own problems and so on and so forth. So maintaining a view to looking at life through that prism of different identities is fundamentally important. It's embracing diversity means to be able to look at those different elements and to understand what they mean in the reality of persons. And I think that's what people can, can, can do to, to be better allies, is to look with that prism and uh, understand that that diversity is there. As to particular organizations, as you can imagine in my position, it is a big no-no to do individual endorsements. <laughs> I, I, I would say, however, that I'm a, given that I am a United Nations special uh, procedures mandate holder, I would say I believe strongly in the ability of the UN to deliver incredible um, support in relation to this pandemic. Uh, my colleagues in special procedures and I have been working nonstop to actually provide advice to try and get this and to serve as conduits between victims and disenfranchised populations and power. And I think the United Nations and all of its agencies uh, deserve uh, the support that we require to actually carry this forward. Mm. Uh, for our viewers, um, uh, we will be posting um, a video that Victor provided us that addresses some of these issues that uh, you can look at it after the uh, conversation is over. And there's going to be a report coming out this fall. Is that right, Victor? That and, is correct. Uh, I will present it to the General Assembly on 27 October. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's going to be virtually because I believe that the General Assembly will be mostly virtual this year. Mm -hmm. But it will be 27 October for sure. That date is very uh, set already. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is an undiplomatic question, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. Um, could you, I think you could definitely point to some countries that are uh, using contact tracing and taking advantage of uh, a crisis to maybe target uh, an LGBT communities. And you gave that example in Uganda. Do you see any countries that are doing this well in following, you know, your Aspire framework that are, uh, and, and what does that look like? Who are those countries? What are um, those countries? I see efforts everywhere, uh, Marie, and I'm, I will provide you a number of examples, not to be too cryptic, um, coming from different latitudes. Um, I think we all first need to acknowledge that uh, on the one hand, uh, I think that it would be very hard. I would be hard pressed to find anybody who had a perfectly um, uh, executable plan uh, from day one in relation to the pandemic. Um, so I think that a number of governments struggled uh, from the beginning to actually uh, 
uh, respond to it for very many different reasons that I won't get into right now. Um, however, the learning curve, uh, I think, has been different in different latitudes. Uh, I think that those states in which there has been uh, an acceptance of not only the pandemic itself, but the reality is that people would be disproportionately impacted by it because of their particular position in that intersectionality, and particularly in relation to social inequality and exclusion and poverty, um, and the efforts to reaching out to those communities are giving what I think uh, are very interesting examples. I know that Argentina uh, presented a number of examples that I consider to be good practice in relation to uh, COVID-19 uh, response. Now, um, that includes, not to be too uh, abstract, that includes quickly ensuring that there would be uh, from very basic needs, such as food uh, assigned to certain points, to assessing within each context, whether it could be religious authorities, whether it would be community authorities, whether there was good relationship with the police, uh, whether it should be uh, community-based elements doing that. Um, provision of information and gathering of data, getting in more into the point of tracing and contact tracing, in Argentina, all of that was done within the community, which means that the community was the one having the safeguard of how was the information processed and anonymized under certain, of course, protocols and rules. And then it was delivered at a certain stage and with as a certain product to uh, the government, to the local governments. There you have an example where the community lent itself and its credibility towards its members to say, we will ensure that you're protected in relation to this. And that was, I thought, uh, good practice in relation to this. Um, there's been a number of uh, very interesting initiatives um, in certain European, European countries in relation to contact tracing that I'm studying. Uh, all of them, without exception, include including the communities. Where the communities have been involved in the design and implementation of the process, you see uh, very little uh, fail. Where they are denied or they are completely not part of the process is where you see those uh, uh, bad stories coming uh, from or horror stories uh, in some cases. So that part of your Aspire framework, it is the maybe the uh, unintended consequences when you don't have community engagement um, and then you know, obviously intentional ones as well. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, we have um, a lot more questions and I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, this has been a fascinating uh, conversation. Um, I guess I'll, add, I'll end with this last one and then you can add any other comments you might have. Um, there seems to be a real concern that, uh, in particular for LGBT people, that the, the need for their privacy and, and data collection. So do you ask someone's gender identity or not? Was, would that cause more problems than help? Uh, how, do you, how do you answer that question? You know, there's discussion now in the U.S. data, including race and ethnicity. I don't, uh, I don't think there's a, I, I don't know what they're talking about gender identity. Uh, so. Uh, do you have anything to offer in that respect? Um, I, I would place it in the context of, um, of course, what is the official position in relation to these issues and whether there is a state-sponsored policy of persecution or whether we are talking about a more um, uh, socially uh, informed processes and so on and so forth. I would place it there. I, I can tell you, I have always great concerns about data collection in relation to sexual orientation, gender identities, and environments of, of criminalization. I've said to the international community that I believe decriminalization has to happen everywhere in the world, in part because I think until that is the case, states cannot really say that they know their population well. And it connects to everything, Marie. Uh, states do not know, if states do not know how families are conformed, 
who people are living with under the same roof and how their families look, they will not understand how their housing policies should look. If states do not understand how to break down health concerns, which we know are objectively different, if you break them down, they don't, their health policies are flawed in my view. And they're there again and there again and there again. It goes along. So I have real concerns in relation to that. In environments where the legal framework is in place, what you need to look is what is the specific sanction that may be um, socially enforced to individuals uh, for revealing their identity. And you need to manage, of course, information in that context. Um, I'm on the record in my report of Mozambique making a comment to the fact that it's a country that decriminalized, but we're still coming out of the closet would condemn you to absolute social exclusion. So mm -hmm. in that case, of course, I think that that inform and again, I mean, particularly because I don't think that the systems are in place to ensure that data would be managed in a way where people can have full trust on it. And again, now let's think about even the third context. How many people have been asked by progressive governments that have a particular progressive stance? I'm going to give an example that is not by no means exclusive to one context, but exists in several contexts. Uh, uh, trans people serving in the military. They may be asked to reveal uh, data and to have that data possessed in uh, official context in a particular context. If that context is to change and a ban is to be enacted, how is that data going to be used on the basis? And what was the informed consent in relation to the particular uh, uh, intent versus the moment in which the data is used? I have real questions in relation to this. So you see, my, my answer would be depending on all of those aspects um, still, in very many contexts, including the most regressive ones, you may have exercises that are so technically well defined, so technically well designed, that they can provide very good intelligence without endangering persons. What are the basic things that need to be done? I think in every context until you have the whole legal framework is you need to have community sensitive communication and design. You need to ensure that information is decentralized. It needs to be used for a particular specific element. And then very important, it needs to be depoliticized. Mm. Data cannot be subject to the um, uh, nuances and, and comes and goes of, of political processes. It needs to be uh, having impartiality. Uh, mm. So where you place this is also very, very important. One last point in relation to the overall topic that we're, um, that we're uh, talking about, Maria, and that I don't want to leave it out just because it's part of the full map that I have here in front of me. I've covered everything, but there is one thing that I, that I didn't cover. I also have significant concerns about the digital divide. Um, we know that people having access to mobile phone technology or internet are not necessarily representative to the whole of the population. So one of the things that we will need to begin to really try and capture is how do we fix how skewed the picture is going to be if we exclude that 50% who in Latin America don't use internet. Mm. Is it going to mean that the picture that we get of the world that we have in front of us is going to be completely excluding the poorest? once and therefore our solutions will only be catering for those that are already with a certain degree of privilege. The data that I have is that in, there's 2 billion people without access to mobile technology. That's 2 billion out of 7 billion persons. So for example, if we were to deeply trust in a future uh, tracing based on mobile technology, how are we going to cater for that 2 billion people that we're not going to be seeing in that picture? And secondly, uh, data that I have, 50% people in Latin America not having access to internet. Um, some 75 people in Africa not having access to internet. So how will you actually breach the skewed way in which the picture would look? 
um, that's not only for LGBT people, but of course includes LGBT people who are disproportionately represented in those that are the poorest in the population. Right, and, and vulnerable and often disenfranchised. Victor, this has really been an enlightening conversation. Um, you add a, your expertise, your depth, your uh, experience in many countries around the world, and it was a pleasure to have you share your information and be part of our um, leadership spotlight. Um, I'm going to have to close this off for now. I do want to give my thanks to uh, the Luce Foundation. Um, the Henry Luce Foundation has supported this project, and we are very grateful for their uh, wisdom in realizing that this particular issue of contact tracing and, and, and location tra tracing um, has implications well beyond COVID. Um, Victor Madrigal Borlos, again, we thank you for your work and your time. You've been a wonderful addition. We do have a couple more panels coming up. Uh, one, uh, Victor, you might even be interested in legal perspectives on mobile location technology during COVID, where we have several uh, lawyers that will be speaking. And then um, I'm also delighted to have uh, Dr. Mei Po Kwan. Uh, coming to us from Hong Kong, talking about tracking movement through space during COVID-19 and beyond, where I think she'll really also give us a, uh, an East Asian perspective and, and a global perspective. I thank you all for joining us today and listening. It's always a pleasure to get together with intelligent, caring people who are trying to address this most difficult time with sound policy, um, depoliticizing issues, so it, clean data and, and also caring for the most vulnerable. So thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you at the next um, Ethical Geo event. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.